chapter number 27 verse number 54 and I want to pray for some of you tonight I feel a very strong mantle of intercession and a prophetic unction one or two of you have already said something but the Lord added to it while we were in our hotel today and I want to finish what God started on last night aren't you glad you're in the waiting room Amen. Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 54, and also John chapter number 4, verse 3 and 4. All right? Matthew chapter number 27, verse 54. When you have it, shout, I have it. Yeah, it says, Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake. Yeah, I don't know if they actually saw an earthquake. They may have saw the result, but we'll play with that a little later. Saw the earthquake and those things that were done. So they saw the earthquake and they saw the result. Interesting. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the son of God, John chapter number four. What verse did I tell you to get? Uh-huh, that's the one I meant for you to get. John chapter number four, verse three through four. When you have it, shout, I have it. And it reads, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Father, bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at the person near you, at least two of them, and give them tonight's subject for the next 20 to 25, maybe even 30 minutes. And it's renovations required. renovations required. I want to make a statement that many of us should keep at the forefront of our hearts, our minds, because if we do not, we'll tend to become a bit embittered and upset at the wrong thing for the wrong reasons at the wrong time. And that statement is, you have an enemy, but that enemy is not the one sitting next to you. You have an enemy, but that enemy is not that frustrating coworker. Is the microphone on? You have an enemy. And that enemy may not be that belligerent family member. You got an enemy. But that enemy is not that bully at school. You got an enemy. And it's not that teacher that will not let up off of you even though you're not doing anything. You have an enemy, but that enemy is not flesh and blood. That enemy is the devil and his minions and his imps and the systems of evil that he set up. 
that if you do not keep that in your heart, you'll begin to fight a battle that will be a continual sliding slope into depression because you'll always feel as if somebody is against you. Now again, it might not happen up here in Cincinnati, Forest Park, Ohio, Ohio. But down in South Carolina, there's some people who are wasting precious energy fighting battles that are fruitless. Now, this is not a part of the message, but I feel led to say it, that to fight flesh is an exercise in futility. Because after you destroy the flesh of that person, that spirit jumps to the next. And if you never target the real enemy, you're going to be fighting all your life. Tell somebody, change where you're fighting. It's easy to slip into that simply because of how the enemy attacks us and where he decides to attack us. He never, by the way, attacks you because he wants your car. He don't need it. Somebody tell him, the, the, the devil doesn't need your car. I know it. He after my car. No, he's not. The devil's not after your house. I know it may feel like it, but he doesn't need one. He stays right now in a temporary condominium called outer darkness while God is preparing his forever home called Sheol. <laughs> so he already taken care of. He ain't even after your honey. What does he know about relationships? He uses those tools to get you where he wants you, and that's in your mind. <laughs> now, those people can be evil, but they're not the devil. Those things can be frustrating, but that's not his end result. His end result is to hit you in the, in the cognitive sense, in your mental space, so that you are in a perpetual battle, not realizing that it's not an external thing, it's an internal thing. That many times you are yelling about an enemy on the outside when it's truly the enemy on the inside. Maybe your enemy is in a uh, me. Let me say that one more time. Maybe the true enemy, uh, you might be sleeping with them. And if you're married, it ain't your spouse. And if you booed up, it ain't them either. The true enemy may be in a me. That somewhere along the line, the enemy hit me in a place that I was not aware of or made fully conscious of. And now I'm looking past where the real fight happens and I feel as if I'm losing at every single turn. So he's, he's coming after my mind. Well, what happens in the mind? It is where perspective lives. Write that word down, perspective. Yeah, it's where perspective lives. Now, there's no need to write that word down without giving a definition. Because if you don't get a definition, then you are bound by whatever you think it is. So here it is in brown gravy form, very simple. We can kind of make it technical, but there's no need to. When we're talking about perspective, we're talking about how you see. Write that down. How you see. Hmm? So once I get your perspective, I now have access 
access to, to the next piece of what happens in your mind called perception. Hmm? So then, what is perception? Perception is what I see. All right, let's say it again. Perspective, how I see, which determines my perception, what I see. One more time. Perspective, how I see. Yeah, which determines my perception, what I see. And then your uh, perception begins to become even more colored by a couple of things. We don't have a lot of time to talk about them all, but let's mention a few. Your beliefs, your upbringing, your culture, your socioeconomic status, your surroundings. Let's talk about beliefs. Um, let's, okay. Uh, you're walking down the street, riding your bike, driving a car, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a black cat crosses in front of you. When that black cat crosses in front of you, you're going to almost break your neck to make sure you get out the car, off your bike, off your path, and do what? You put an X where that cat crossed. Because if I don't put an X where that cat crossed, it means I have bad luck. Oh, y'all don't, don't, don't know about that in Ohio. That's a country thing. Well, let me school you. Okay, you don't know that one. You bet not come in the house and put your hat on the bed because hats on the bed means bad luck. And you believe it. Your perspective, your perception and your perspective has now been colored by something that you heard, which means it's now in your mind space, and now all of a sudden, a hat has power over you. A black cat has power. Oh, wait, um, you know, if you're walking on the sidewalk, at least when we were younger, you don't step on cracks. Oh, okay, you know that one, that one, you know. All right, I hit one, you know. Oh, well, thank the Lord. Because if you step on the crack, now how in the world can a slit in the cement cause for there to be injury to my mama? But you believed it so that you would jump over cracks so that you don't step on it. All right, maybe, maybe that's not the one. If you and uh, one of your friends are walking down the street and there's a pole somebody better make a decision because if you happen to go on one side of the pole and I go on the other side of the pole We've now, oh, okay, so that, oh, you split the pole. And you don't need to be splitting poles because that's going to bring you, oh, and we believed it even now with your Holy Ghost walking right, spitting white self. You'll stop and make sure you go all the way back and then move yourself over so that we all go on the right side of the pole. I'm going somewhere. I'm taking the long road, but I'll, I'm coming around the mountain when I come. Okay, maybe that one. Okay. Let your hand start itching. Oh. 
Because ah, if that hand starts itching, then oh, just got paid Friday night. Money in my pole. Oh, I'm sorry. But you got to be specific because if it's the left hand, you're going to be losing money. But if it's the right hand, you're going to get money. And we believed it. You see, the devil isn't attacking you as much as you think. That all he had to do was plant a seed at one point of your life, at one time of your life, that was given to you from someone of influence and affluence, and you began to follow a road, follow a map that was designated to keep you completely discombobulated because he understood that all I have to do is hit them in their perspective to mess up their perception so I can keep them locked inside of whatever it is I want them locked in forever. What I see is based on how I see. And if how I see has had damage. No wonder, no wonder you were born in the family that you were born in. And no wonder, no, wait, no wonder that um, you had to struggle the way you struggled. No wonder, no wonder he made sure that you were always the one picked out to be, is there anybody in this room that just felt like you always had a target on your head? You could be doing nothing at all and something's gonna find you or some. no wonder because he said I needed to influence your perspective early so even if you get the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit becomes limited because of your perspective and your perception <laughs> okay all right maybe maybe that's not clear so let's let's push the envelope psychologically psychologically there is a test that they do call an ink blot test and they'll take ink and put it in a cup and throw it against a wall just fling it and let it hit there however it's going to hit there then they'll get 10 different people or how many ever different people and they'll bring them in front of this ink blocks and they'll say one question what do you see one person will look at it and say hmm uh that looks like a cat. They walk them out. Someone else comes in, different walk of life, don't know the person that just walked in there, and they'll say, yeah, uh, that looks like that car that I just sold. Somebody else walks in and says, yeah, that looks like that hag that I saw on TV. Hmm? What was different? It wasn't the ink. It was the perspective of the person standing in front of the ink. Oh, So then where there is faulty perspective, ladies and gentlemen, there is erroneous per perspective. Where there is faulty perspective, there will be erroneous perception. Hmm. But if there is erroneous perception, then there is limited reception. That I could literally shrink what it is I'm supposed to get simply because how I see and what I see. Okay, 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 okay. We got to speed it up. So then, hmm. We're in this moment right now, this family refresh moment, and there's some people in here that's receiving much from God. But then there's some others who's on the exact same row that you're on that's receiving very little. And it has nothing to do with what songs the praise and worship song. It has nothing to do with the exhortation that the bishop gave. It has nothing to do with the word that I'm preaching right now. It will have nothing to do with what God's going to do later. It has everything. 
everything to do with my perspective and my perception and my perspective and my perception limits my reception and although it's here for me to get I can never attain it because I can't see it Hmm. Oh, no. And there are times, let me, let me slide into some leadership for a moment. There are some times when leaders struggle and they are frustrated because they know what they heard and they know what the Lord told them to do. But when they give it out, it's, it's hard for the people or anyone to begin to get with them simply because they can't see what I see. And it has nothing to do with my anointing. It has everything to do with their perspective. So, the Bible says, and I'm almost there, that Jesus could do no mighty works with where he was from. That he had to leave where he was from in order to activate. Now, that's interesting to me, Bishop. That's interesting to me because one went, once he, uh, God, interrupted this young girl's life, by saying, hey, oh, Mary, this young girl that already had her wedding planned out, already had who she wanted to get married to, already knew where they were going to live. There is an angel that stops her in mid-plan and say, hey, oh, Mary, and she is immediately impregnated with the king of kings and the lord of lords. She is immediately impregnated with the CEO of the universe. She is immediately impregnated with the incarnate word, Emmanuel, God tabernacled in flesh. She is now carrying God in the flesh in her belly and because of how the circumstances went in order to carry God she was already ostracized because she was yet to be married and because she was yet to be married in other words she got pregnant out of wedlock people begin to look at her differently their perspective and their perception said something's funny about this here arrangement mm. but then there were people in that city that were sick and dying and died with the answer in her belly <laughs> and the only reason why they couldn't get the answer was because they could not see that she had the answer on the inside of her good God from almighty Zion they started marginalizing her they started putting her in a category they started saying I know what family she's from they started saying I know her background I came tonight to kind of help some folk who have been marginalized you know that there's greatness living inside of your belly and you have an answer for some problems that people are going through but they're overlooking you simply because they know where you came from and their perspective and their perception has you minimized not who you are not what you are but how they see and the Bible says that that um, the husband said I got to put you away I got to move you from where you are into another place I got to cover you because they don't understand what God is doing in your life and they begin to make a trip to their cuz house you know cuz Elizabeth mm -hmm. and uh, Elizabeth is now pregnant as well again Y'all ain't talking. Uh, but but um, uh, philosophers have said that was not her first child. But that she was pregnant before but kept having miscarriages. See, you got to understand hmm, that women who could not have babies at that time were looked down upon. So they moved out of the city when she got pregnant again because they weren't sure whether this baby was going to keep or not. Mm -hmm. And so now she is in the sixth and seventh month of a pregnancy and she feels nothing moving inside of her. And now I have another dead thing on the inside of me that I started and I don't know what to do with it other than hide away. But here comes Mary <sighs> walking up the street. Now, wait a minute. You got to understand that the reason why Mary is walking up the street is simply because she was ostracized where she was and she had no other place to lay her head and be safe and so then she was pushed out of her comfort zone into something else can I minister and prophesy to at least 
50 of you that have been sitting comfortable in the places and you thought the devil was trying to push you out into something else. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go into there. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to see that. It was not the devil. It was God nudging you out of your comfort zone because I have somebody waiting for you that has something dead in their spirit that only you have the answer for. Would you grab somebody by the hand and shake it like you're going to shake it off and tell them I am somebody's answer. Uh, the Bible says that when Mary gets up to Lizbeth's house and uh, she begins to knock on the door, Elizabeth with that dead baby on the inside of her womb opens up the door and says, hey Mary, how you doing? And then Mary didn't have to lay hands. Mary didn't have to speak in tongues. Mary didn't have to dance. All Mary had to do was open up her mouth. And when she began to speak, the Bible says John leaped in the bush. The baby leaped inside of Elizabeth. And at that moment, the baby woke up. What was once dead became alive because what was in Mary was now received. Here we go. See, the problem with some of us is that we've been trying to pour our oil on people we're not called. Hey, everybody. This is Bishop R. Christopher Brown III, the relevant leadership strategist, Mr. Brown Gravy himself, and I need your help. I want you to partner with me in this endeavor to get the word out. Hear me. The gospel is free, but to get that out takes money and it takes resources. I need your help. If you would, partner with us through Cash App, through PayPal, and send a donation, send a seed specifically to help fund the Brown Gravy Moment TV. I believe that when you partner with me, that you can become a part of blessing millions of people. And hear me, ladies and gentlemen, when you do that, the residual that comes back to you is amazing. Yeah, when you bless others, God says, I put you at the front of the line to bless you. Partner with me today at Bishop Brown 3. That's Cash App, dollar sign, Bishop Brown 3. PayPal, Bishop Brown 3 at gmail.com. Whichever way you'd like to do it, or snail mail, uh, you can send it to 105 Sheraw Street, Bennisville, South Carolina, 29512 great city of Venezuela, South Carolina. I can't wait to partner with you to spread the gospel. It's a brown gravy moment and it's going to be a blessing. See you. This is Bishop R. Christopher Brown III, Senior Pastor of the Sword of Truth in the great city of Bennettsville, South Carolina, 105 Chiraw Street. We believe a church alive is worth the drive. You should find yourself right in our city during our service time, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, 7 uh, p.m. on Tuesday evening, Sunday service, Tuesday Bible study, you matter and you belong there. Preaching with power. It's the